Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Asian Impact Webinar on the launch of the Asian Development Policy Report, or ADPR, which is a new flagship report from ADB's research department that addresses a major development challenge facing the region. The inaugural ADPR is uh, on aging well in Asia, and it was led by uh, my colleague, Dr. Aiko Kikawa. So we will begin the webinar with a presentation by Dr. Aiko Kikawa on ADPR. Over to you, Aiko. Thank you very much, Tom. And good afternoon to all the participants of the webinar. As you're aware, population aging is a phenomenon that is really going to change our economy and the society for the coming decades. What this report tries to do is to ask, take stock of this very gigantic change in our society by answering some of the following questions. How do we define the well-being in old age? What state of the well-being our current old Asians are in? How are government responding to rapidly aging population? And whether the region are sufficiently prepared to age well? So in this inaugural Asian development report, Aging Well in Asia, there are five overreaching messages that uh, emerge. First, development Asia is aging rapidly, which reflects the development success of the region, but the region remains largely unprepared. As I would show, the persistent disease burden, lack of decent jobs, limited access to healthcare and long-term care, and issues of the loneliness and social isolation are on rise. Second, key policy agenda across the region, this report stress, is to ensure the well-being of all the Asians. There are many elements to the well-being, but then for all the Asians, four elements matter. Health, productive work, economic security, and family and social engagement. However, there's a wide inequality that really separate all the Asians across all four dimensions of well-being. Significant gap exists between men and women, and also workers who are working in informal sector versus other sectors. This report finds that healthy aging among the four elements really stands out as the critical factor that affects other elements of well-being. But it's important to stress that this key a success to the healthy aging is it depends on the choice that individual make over time and not just in old age. And therefore, aging Asia, aging Asia urgently need to step up its effort to help Asian age well through lifelong life cycle approach for the whole of the populations. And this comprehensive aging policy would foster healthy and productive cohort of older Asian and to maximize their contribution to economy and society. So where are we in terms of the aging? So aging, there's no doubt that the region is aging rapidly, although there are some differences across the countries. On your left, you will see that the share of uh, older person defined in this report as those aged 60 and above is going to double in the next three decades to about 1.2 billion representing about the fourth of the entire population in the region. In terms of how quickly we're aging, on the right side, you would see how the population share, uh, the share to the, of the older person to the population will grow from 10% to the 20%. As you would see, there are large variations as to how different countries are aging in our economy, but it's also clear that aging is advanced in even some of the country which are considered relatively young, such as Indonesia or India. And what really characterizes this demographic change in the region is not just its speed, but it's the fact that it's taking place at the lower income settings. And therefore the concern is that whether the region is going to grow old before gaining sufficient capacities and the resources to ensure that we all age well. And these concerns are uh, quite a, a valid concern. If you look at the uh, key, some of the key indicators of well-being, such as poverty, 
we were very aware that the absolute poverty has declined in the region, but then there's still a relative high, relatively high incident of relative poverty among older Asians. As you see in the orange bar on the chart, the prevalence are much higher uh, in some of the countries, such as uh, Korea or, or in uh, Taipei, China, where you see that their prevalence of relative poverty is much higher than those of the whole population or of the entire or of the children. So, uh, and yet these poverty data also failed to capture some of the more complexity of the poverty of older people, such as being advantaged in the resource allocation within the household, which is not captured in scenario like this. And these are particularly pronounced among older women. So more nuanced view and to understand the challenges faced by old people, a more uh, other measurement beyond the poverty has to be explored and this is why, why this report used to propose well-being as the key concept. So what's well-being? Well-being is a, a holistic and multidimensional state achieved by meeting various human needs and that the income alone cannot measure it. And if you look at the dimensions of well-being, a prevailing literature that looks at the uh, life satisfaction, such as happiness or mental well-being, point us to about four elements that are particularly important to old age. Those are health, being productive, economically secured, and uh, engaged uh, with families and also to the societies. And among this, as I mentioned, good health is particularly important. And, um, but again, what's important is that the, uh, this health and others uh, has to be really maintained uh, together because they will have one implication to the others. Uh, one dimension can affect quite uh, largely the other dimensions. So how is region doing in terms of ensuring the well-being of all the person in this element? And here's the, what the, our dashboard uh, based on uh, microdata representing about 80% of the older person in the region is telling. First, in terms of the health, about 57% of the older person at least have one diagnosed communicable disease, yet about 60% do not attend regular health checkups. And up to 43% of older person with physical limitation do not receive necessary care. In terms of the productivity and productive work, many or majority, overwhelming majority, about 94% of them work in the informal sector, which then leads to having very limited access to pension. So overall, about 40% have no pension, either contributory or social. The report also find the increased evidence of the, long uh, of the loneliness, uh, and which then have strong link to depression at the rate of about 16%. So in short, regions currently unprepared to rapidly to deal with the rapidly unfolding uh, demographic transitions. So in this report, we look at the each section of the each chapter of the report looks at the four element of each of the four elements of the well-being, discuss the state, and also cover some of the government policies and to evaluate what will be the way forward. In this webinar in particular, we focus on the productivity and also some of the economic security uh, aspect relates to the productivity uh, and that uh, I would just touch on those and that uh, in, in this presentation. So in terms of the work, uh, where, where we stand in terms of uh, work and wh where all the person work, what are the pattern characteristics of their work and retirement patterns, the report is able to tell quite a variety of different stories. Uh, first, the about the, uh, labor force participation patterns. This chart shows their labor force participation of those in the late 50s to 60s, and which stands about 73% for men and 42% for women. But you see wide range uh, across the regions. And what it shows in the diamond is the rate at about 20 years ago, and red indicating declining patterns. So for men in this age group, the trend overall is about declining. Whereas for women, because a greater number of women are working at the prime age, the, the latest trend shows that it's more on the increasing patterns. And, uh, but again, there are large difference that explains it. What are those factors? First is the income levels. Second, different policy surroundings. 
particularly the retirement age or the pension access or the adequacy of the pensions. And cultural norm continues to influence, as you see in the large variation of how women participate in labor force. More at the individual level, you also see things such as necessity, whether people have capacity, both health, mental, and uh, skills, and whether there's opportunity to work, uh, explain some of the uh, labor force decision, participation decision of older persons. If you look at within country variations, uh, which does not show in the earlier chart, you see some interesting patterns. So really the work patterns uh, differ widely, even among older person. And that on your left, what you see is the labor force participation of by uh, the education group. Interestingly, the participation of the educated, uh, tertiary educated group are quite high in the prime age area, but as soon as it kicks, uh, uh, um, retirement kicks in, their employment rate tend to go down. And what you see is that much higher participation rate among uh, primary educated groups who primarily work in the informal sectors. And you see the similar pattern on your right if you compare the participation or the employment rate of all the person in rural and urban area and about rural, uh, rural workers working longer and stay longer and retiring later. So what that really tells is that the informality uh, explains a large part of the high labor force participation of, of all the persons and that they, our data shows about 94% of all the workers work in these informal sectors. And this is higher, higher than the uh, prime age work. And also it's the older women will be uh, finding themselves uh, in a greater chance of the informal working in the informal market. And this chart shows where is the industry where all the workers or workers of different age work. And green is the agriculture and red is the wholesale and retail trade. So those are two major industries that are continue to employ workers and provide opportunities, so to speak, because they would not have a specific defined retirement age. And that's where all the person have worked in the past. And this leads to a particular um, element of uh, issues when it comes to making the retirement decisions. This chart shows the coverage of the contributory and uh, different types of pension. I would like you to draw your attention on the blue, sorry, green bar on the last shaded area that shows the coverage of contributory and work-related pensions. And this rate is particularly low in the region. Overall, about 19% of all the person have these pensions. And some with some variations in the country, such as Philippines having much higher rate of close to 40, but as low as 3% in Bangladesh. And it really calls for, you know, that it, it really shows, explains why all the persons in informal sectors are working longer for lack of for lack of savings or opportunity to save so that they can retire. And as I mentioned, this informality is a higher among women. So if you look at the share of men to women uh, of the contributory pension beneficiaries, uh, females uh, are largely the uh, dominant uh, receivers. And you also see that with the urban rural uh, divisions as well. And this informality and lack of pension and therefore a smooth transition, uh, option to smoothly transitions to a retirement uh, is not only uh, the phenomenon that is shown in the older group, but still persists in the prime working age group. So this chart shows the share of those uh, prime age workers, 50 to 64 percent age, age of uh, 15 to 64, with the membership contribution, uh, membership making contributory pensions, and you would see and the uh, and its correlation to the informal share of employment. You would see that still uh, in this region, many countries only see about 20 percent or less of its workers, including the young workers, contributing to this. And low rates are particularly noticeable in some countries in South Asia or Mekons. So in the earlier chart, I mentioned about how uh, 
all the person with uh, informal markets are working in the informal market are working longer, but there was also a peculiar incidence of uh, educated and perhaps skilled worker in a formal sector retiring early. So that's another uh, aspect that this report also focused on and look at then then what are the uh, potentials that these workers in the formal sector who retire early, possibly with the remaining health and skill capacity to offer to the economy. According to our analysis using these nine country data, it shows that uh, older workers uh, in their 60s have quite a large health capacity to work, but some notable numbers are not working. So on your left side, you see a bar representing the share of older person and according to their health uh, indicators are fit to work. And that represent in most of the country about overall 80% or above. But what you see in the orange share is the worker who are not uh, working, who are not taking part in the labor force. And those are substantially high in some countries. Uh, among people in early 60s, about 20% in Malaysia, 20% uh, in uh, India, uh, those are high. And also, if you look at the uh, workers uh, past some of the retirement age group, 65 to 69, those shares are even higher. So uh, in, with this such data, you also look at the scenario where these workers are uh, to, to, to sort of measure this untapped work capacity as a potential source of silver dividend. Uh, we have measured their contrib potential contribution to the economy by a uh, back of the envelope calculation using the minimum wage to see what would be the possible GDP contribution. And those are quite large. So for example, in India or Korea, uh, by this uh, untapped workforce of all the person uh, can have they been working in a labor force, it would boost the GDP to about 1.5% in these countries. And uh, to, for uh, Japan, it's 1.4%, uh, Vietnam, uh, 11, sorry, 1.1%, and on average, about 0.9%. And uh, at this moment, these uh, former workers do face some uh, limited lack of, uh, limited access to job opportunity because of the mandatory retirement age, uh, because of the lack of job that matches their skills or preference, for example, working uh, for short hours. And a lot can be done to really address, uh, to, to match these workers with the potential opportunities. So in this uh, chapter three, we have uh, looked at the different uh, elements of work, where are the challenges and opportunities to come up with a uh, policy recommendation that really addresses diverse circumstances of formal and informal older workers and call for tailored policy that responds to these two groups. So for the uh, older workforce and informal uh, sectors, government in the region need to make a more concerted effort to improve the working condition and make uh, some of the uh, physically taxing work uh, less. For example, through automation or adoption of the technology in agriculture. And also these workers have very limited access to labor protections or access to pensions, which can be addressed uh, by expanding these services or providing a uh, more flexible option of pension contribution to informal workers. And some countries have seen success, for example, by offering a matched fund or bundling with other service that can provide their labor protections. So those uh, activities will be very important for informal, uh, currently uh, working informal workforce in the old older workforce in the informal sectors. Uh, what are the recommendations for uh, the formal workforce who have uh, work capacity to offer beyond the retirement age? Some of the low hanging fruits that can be addressed is to really make an adjustment in the retirement age uh, in line with the healthy longevity that can offer uh, flexible uh, retirement pathways. So that uh, one suggestion would be to extend uh, retirement age, but other it's just scrap it and that to make it flexible, it really depends on the health and other preference of the older person to decide when to retire. 
And enhancing employability through lifelong learning and skills development are important. Uh, best starting at the mid-career or, or onset of the career and then at the old age. And replacing seniority practice, which is very still prevalent in Asia, with performance-based uh, remuneration can address some of the performance to wage gap that the firm uh, that really encourages firm to let go of the older workers. And some of the government uh, initiatives, such as those in Singapore or uh, Japan, have uh, succeeded in incentivizing employee to retain and hire older workers. And this applies to both formal and informal workers, but making job more age friendly with flexible job arrangement that offers smoother transition from work to retirement, not zero to one, uh, one to zero, but the, they'll be able to, for example, reduce the work for uh, work, uh, working hours, uh, changing the nature of the task that that fits their uh, capacities, et cetera, would really help them to uh, make this smooth transition while also being able to work uh, in the style that they desire. And in a bigger labor force and uh, labor market conditions, uh, conducting awareness campaign to combat ageism would be important uh, because we still observe uh, many of the recruitment advertisement, for example, mentioning age limit, or that there's some uh, perceived perception against older workers that they are not as productive as young workers. And they're also concerned that, for example, extending this retirement age can, for example, hurt the employment of the youth. But then our uh, reviews of the evidence shows that uh, both youth and old age, uh, older workers employment are much prone to the economic cycle. And it's not a zero sum game of taking job to another, although this applies to maybe some very specific settings such as the government sector. So overall, government really needs to step up its effort to empower Asians of all ages to plan and prepare for old age. And a set of specific policy here that comes from the each chapters and also each element of the well-being are really essential to creating an environment in which people can then invest in their well-being of the old age. And here we mentioned quite a lot about the government but the private sector has an important role to play in creating age-friendly jobs. And it's really the early investment, which is the key to harnessing this silver dividend in the region. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aiko, for a very clear presentation of the inaugural ADPR on aging well in Asia. We now move on to a panel discussion, let me just very briefly introduce our three distinguished panelists. Professor Pauline Strohan from the Singapore Management University, who is director of the Center for Research on Successful Aging. Dr. Hataraporn Laowong, who is a plan and policy analyst at the Office of the National Economic and Social Development Council in Thailand. And of course, uh, our chief economist, ADB's chief economist, Dr. Albert Park. So let me begin the panel discussion by asking each of the panelists for their views on, in their view, how urgent or profound is uh, Asia's rapid population aging and how important is it to have a policy report such as the ADPR deal with the aging issue? So let's go in the order of uh, Professor Paulin, uh, Dr. La Wong, and our chief economist. Professor Paulin. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Park. And first, let me congratulate the uh, Asia Development Bank uh, for an ex excellent piece of work. Your report is amazing. So for colleagues who are online, please do download their report. It's a very good read. And thank you for your presentation, Dr. Kikawa. Uh, so I think that in terms of urgency, no one is, nowhere is it more urgent than in Singapore, right? We are such a small country. All we have is human resource. By 2026, we would be super aged. By 2030, one in four Singaporeans will be 65 and above. And I just came from a meeting this morning where we've been told that aside from Singapore, Germany, Japan, and China 
are the fastest growing in the world. So we are all racing, right, <laughs> to become, you know, this silver generation uh, predominance. Um, I don't, it's not a bad thing. Certainly, I don't think we should see this as a crisis. It will be a crisis if we are not prepared. But if we are prepared, then there's so much we can do to leverage this powerful silver sector of our population. And a report like the ABD has put out, I think is very important information because it does chart the way strategically for us to focus our resources and jointly learn how to receive a super aged society. Thank you, Dr. Park. Thank you, Professor Strohan. Dr. Lao Wong, please. Yes, um, the compliment for me as well for, for the report. Actually, I do send you know the report to my colleague already. It's so good, you know, and the best comparison that I ever seen. Um, for me, I think Thailand would join the super age society <laughs> with you know Singapore very soon as well. So within ten years, we will have like more than eighteen million elderly. So I think it's quite crucial, and you know, it's very big proportion of elderly that we we should be take care. And I have to accept that you know, some of our policies currently is not adapt um, so well in such you know a large proportion you know especially in how we normalize the elderly employment you know how we um, improve the healthy aging something like that so you know the report would help us a lot you know, to sharpen more focus you know into you know such a crucial priorities over to me thank you uh, Albert please. Yeah, so just directly answering your question, Tom, I think uh, addressing the well-being of older people in Asia is a very urgent policy uh, challenge. If you just look at the numbers that are, are uh, summarized in the report, uh, you know, 60% of older people don't get a regular health checkup, um, that 40% have no access to pensions, that 43% have some kind of physical care needs that are not being met, that 16% of older people say they feel lonely most of the time. Um, I think that's a direct kind of call for um, support. And there are really opportunities where we can see clearly how government could help fill that space. And if you add on to that, you know, that many societies are becoming older and older, faster and faster then the challenges are just going to get greater as we go forward. They're already great just looking at current elderly. But if we also think about the numbers are going to be much more in the future, um, I think all of all governments should really start thinking now about what they need to do. Thank you, Albert. Now, let me uh, turn on to some more focused questions, more specifically questions of promoting employment of older persons. So. This question is for Professor Strong. Singapore, of course, is uh, one of the most uh, advanced economies in terms of the uh, demographic transition. In other words, it's at a, at a very advanced stage of a population aging process. And this ADPR thus highlights many initiatives taken by regional governments to promote employment of older persons. Now, can you tell us more about these government strategies and what important lessons can the rest of Asia learn from these government initiatives, Professor? Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Park. Well, let me preface by starting that Singapore is a very small country um, and we are a fairly young nation. So overall, you know, I think that it is easier for us to move ahead on strategies and roll them out, and, and therefore um, we have a lot more to report, right? Um, some of the highlights, I think, when I go through, you know, the uh, what we have done for Singaporeans, um, a lot of it centers around ensuring that the legislation encourages older workers to continue working, that older workers will have uh, financial support for skills upgrading so that we are talking about multiple careers over the life course. Um, and also, in order to encourage people to continue working, there is always a keen eye to ensure that as we work, we can feel that our retirement funds are improved through what we don't have a pension in Singapore now. We have the Central Provident Fund, 
the CPF, which is uh, compulsory or forced self savings, right? So through work, the government ensures that the CPF of employees are continually topped up. So a lot of the bonuses that government gives up is through CPF. So if you are not working, you will not get it, right? So, so these are the strategies which I think is a carrot at the end of the day to encourage all of us to stay working for as long as we want to and for as long as we can. So just this year in 2024, we have uh, through legislation extended the retirement age to 64 plus three. So the statutory retirement age is 64, and then there's an additional three years of re-employment. So we expect these figures to keep inching up, to catch up with you know, the life expectancy of the population. Now, we are able to do this. So I'm mindful that we are able to do this without as much uh, resistance from, from the public because we don't have a pension system, right? I understand that elsewhere in the world where there are pensions tied to retirement age, there's a big struggle because when retirement age is extended, then there is this concern that, you know, the, the population will not be able to access or, you know, to leverage pension. So complex issues that have to be taken, I think, holistically. So in Singapore, our CPF release is at 55 years and government tries not to touch that too much. So even when we continue to work beyond 55, beyond 60, at 55, we can still draw down on our CPF savings as long as the amount that is locked for retirement adequacy remains locked. It's a complex system in a certain sense, and it requires a lot of tweaks. Um, and Singaporeans are used to it, so each time there is a tweak, there's a lot of justification. And of course, you know, there will, there will always be those who are not happy. But at the end of the day, I think we realize that if we are living longer, then it is supremely important that there is enough to sustain us. So part of our problem now is many have saved, but our worry is the savings has not, is not going to be adequate to cover us for the extended longevity that we now enjoy. So this means that in addition to extension of retirement age, it is also very important that we ensure that older workers remain relevant to employment. Uh, so this year, again, we was there was an enhancement of skills future credits. So each of us, in, in, if you live in Singapore, will have a, a, an account that's called skills future credits. And you use these credits to pay for skills upgrading and retraining so that you can either you know, make yourself more employable or um, to have enough skills to jump off to a new job. And this year, we've just been told that $4,000 will be added to each of our accounts. Mm -hmm. So these are the strategies that we've been yeah. um, seeing. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Dr. Lao Wong. Thailand is a classical example of a rapidly aging middle-income Asian country, and Thailand is already uh, experiencing, experience, experiencing labor shortage, shortage in agriculture and other sectors. So in light of this, what is the Thai government's priorities and uh, policy actions to promote employment of older Thai persons? <laughs> Thank you. Um, for Thailand, uh, for the elderly employment, and we put a lot of effort into many policies, you know, at the national level. You know, for example, we just have the long-term population plan, and also, you know, the national elderly plan itself has the big portion that advocate for the, uh, you know, elderly employment by, you know, upskilling um, the elderly, you know, especially in the necessary skills and digital literacy, and also, you know, try to support them to have their own business especially at the community level, you know, that affects et cetera. That's we've been put in, uh, into the policy. And recently, I think the Ministry of the Social Development and Human Security, he come to play himself, you know, in the elderly employment. So if the minister come to play in this policy arena, I think it's something there. And he, he tried to focus more on upskilling, how to reduce the barriers into the employment you know, for elderly, and also extending the retirement age. That's kind of measures that, um, you know, in the focus. 
in reality, but I think we still have some gaps, you know, because if you look at the data on the ground, we have the, you know, smart job for the elderly. But what mm -hmm. we can do is like, it doesn't meet the demand for the elderly. Like, um, let me show you the statistics. During, you know, 2017 and 2020, there are about 6,200, you know, applicants, but only 3,200 positions available. We do have the MOU with the private enterprises with the 18,000 positions, but you know, contradictory, only 7,400 applicants are there and about 50% of them can obtain the jobs. You know, that's the, the gap that we're still seeing. We do have the National Elderly Fund for the elderly who wants to set their own business you know, with the, a certain fund like for 30,000 baht for individuals, but still last year, the government of the funds, you know, they can give only 623 you know, individuals only you know, for, for this fund. So you see that there are a lot of gaps in terms of if we compare um, these figures with the elderly who wants to work you know, from the labor or so we, we found that over 100,000 elderly still want to work and the gap is there. And sadly and unfortunately, there is no such clear evidence of why you know, it happened and how we can a little bit, you know, bolster of you know these kind of measures. So I think this is the next step that we should do, uh, you know, during this time. And also, you know, the integration of the work plan among the line agency is one thing that that we should put, you know, uh, and focus more and kind of improve, you know, how uh, how we work. So I think you know that's the you know certain of the elderly employment that we have there, but I think we should move on and correct some measures to be more effective and more efficient. Okay, thank you. Uh, Albert, perhaps this is a quite important question for the region because, uh, of course, countries like Thailand and China are age aging very rapidly, but many countries in the a region are still young. So the question is, should these uh, younger countries, like the Philippines, for example, also start preparing for an older population? And also, what can these younger countries do to prepare their workforce to age well? Over to you, Al. Thank you. Well, well I think uh, young population countries uh, should not be complacent. Uh, for one, you know, we know from the experience of uh, Korea, Vietnam, and maybe Thailand that aging kind of can accelerate even faster than initially expected with rapidly dropping fertility rates. Um, if we're, but one luxury that younger countries have is they have a little bit more time to prepare for when uh, much greater shares of their population are going to be older. And, you know, the report really emphasizes the need for life cycle investments to promote healthy aging, which means that you can't wait till people are old to start investing in them if you want them to age well. You have to start making investments when they're much younger, and in particular in their health, because we found in the report that health is the big factor that really contributes positively to mental well-being, to being able to work longer, uh, to feeling, to having, being able to engage socially and so be kind of healthier mentally. And so, you know, we know that some of the countries now have universal health insurance, like uh, Korea, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, but many of the countries do not. So to support healthy, uh, better health at all ages, we need uh, health insurance. And we also need the health insurance to provide good coverage, not very poor coverage. And if you look at the indices that kind of incorporate both the amount of coverage and the quality of that coverage, we see that some of the regions are lagging a bit, especially in some of the countries in South Asia and in the Pacific. And these are younger uh, countries. Um, uh, and the other the other thing is, uh, you know, we saw before that uh, preventive health care is also really important. You know, everyone should be getting regular health checkups to make sure that we can catch uh, uh, some of the non-communicable disease problems earlier and manage them so that people uh, become healthier throughout the lifetime. And by the time they get older, it's going to yield huge dividends with greater work capacity to work longer. Now, in addition, I think countries need to prepare for the um, 
economic security needs of older workers. And so thinking about preparing pension programs, uh, you know, it, when uh, there are not very many older people, you can be very generous in terms of pensions because there doesn't cost very much. But if you want to prepare for the future when there's going to be a lot more older people, you need to think about how the financing will work. So you need to put in systems, if it's employer provided insurance, um, or private insurance, you need to think about what are the contribution uh, schemes that can support uh, being able to draw benefits and older age, uh, mandatory provident funds, et cetera. Um, if you're trying to design a, more of a social pension scheme where you know informal workers, everyone can get coverage in the future, you can still design them in a way where you have some contributions that are required of people um, as they, uh, before they actually retire. So the Chinese kind of rural pension program is like that. It really started as a social pension program where all of the current elderly just got paid a modest pension. But for younger people, they started asking those people to contribute. They still were heavily, have been heavily subsidizing that program, but by having younger people start to contribute, they can start to collect financing that can help support this in a more uh, sustainable way. And finally, you know, we heard from, I. Um, Aiko, how you know there are a lot of institutional uh, factors that prevent people from working uh, into older age. Uh, one is they may lack skills. So this Skills Future Credits Program of Singapore is a great idea for uh, supporting older workers to keep gaining more skills before they reach old, the older ages, but also having wage setting being more flexible, getting rid of uh, discrimination. Uh, against older workers in job advertisements, these kind of things can be done early and set the stage for a much more um, healthy process of aging. Thanks a lot, Al Albert. Um, I have second round of questions, but can you please keep your answers to two minutes because we do want to leave some time for Q&A from the audience. So uh, two minutes maximum, please. So Professor Strohan, this question is for you. What are the trajectories of the career careers of mature and older women? How would they change over time? And what can governments and firms do to support women, older women, to stay in the workforce and remain productive? Two minutes, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I think the aspirations of men and women in Singapore are converging, right? So I, uh, in that sense, the gender uh, differentiation may not be that stark. But I suppose for, for, for women, one concern is for those, for women who have taken a step back for other caregiving responsibilities like childcare and maybe even elder care, right? Um, how do we encourage them to return to the workforce without feeling a strong sense of discrimination, right? So this, I think, has to do with two aspects. One, skills upgrading so that they keep relevant, you know, so that when they re-enter, they don't feel like, you know, they've come back, you know, from the, you know, from, 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 and, you know, a, a, a bad place, right, where they no longer are relevant. And of course, the second is to continue to encourage employers to be open-minded about older employees. So here we have a whole set of incentives that government has rolled out you know, all these like goodies, there's a whole list of them, right? If you have, you know, X proportion of older workers, the government will give you some bonus. If you employ an older worker, the government will co-partner employer to pay off their CPF and, and have, a you know, the kind of a, a little bit of a, a additional assistance for employers so that it becomes an incentive for employers to hire a post-50 or post-55 or a post-60 person compared to a younger person. So, so that's one. But of course, the second important thing is while we talk about you know, making sure that the employment receives these older workers, we also have to remember we need to encourage people to, to want to work, right? Um, so that's an important consideration which we sometimes leave out of the equation. So very important to remind ourselves that we need to transform work cultures so that it will be palatable for older workers, older women to come back to work I mean, at, at the age of 50. Why would you want to go back to clock, you know, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. hours and then sacrifice your weekends and public holidays and all that? That's not going to happen. So we need to transform work cultures as well so that it is attractive beyond pay for individuals 
to re-engage in the workplace. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Dr. Lao Wong, agriculture is, of course, a major employer of uh, older Thai workers. So in your view, what can the government do to support older farmers in Thailand? Mm -hmm. Let me give you the context of the Thai farmer first. Like, you know, 60% of our elderly work in agricultural. And with that, you know, most of them live with the international, I mean, multi-generation families. So the main intervention of the, you know, current measure from the government is how to, I mean, support the young, smart farmers, you know, into the system kind of to replace the elderly, you know, uh, who are aged and, you know, maybe some that can adapt to more technological advancement, like the youngster can, can do very well. But, you know, what I notice is that they still not integrate the wisdom and the expertise of the elder farmers, you know, with the younger generations is not yet there. That should be integrated because they live, you know, within the same family. So that, that's the first one. And I see that, that there is another promising you know, opportunity for elderly farmers who can turn to do like the agricultural tourism because Thailand is very well known for tourism. So I think one area that maybe we can explore more is the agricultural tourism done by the elderly farmers. Say so over to you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Uh... Albert, so this question is for you. What can ADB do to support the uh, regional government's efforts to promote the well-being of older Asians? Uh, more specifically, what can ADB do to follow up on the findings of this important report? Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, I actually wanted to say something about agriculture. I, I just wanted to point out that, you know, because... Um, Farmers are really informal workers and often don't have access to pensions, that in some cases, farmers have no choice but to work until they drop, basically, uh, even when they're not healthy because they need the income to support themselves or their family. And so actually, in some aspects, if we have a better uh, system of economic support in terms of pension coverage, it might lead to less employment by older workers uh, for whom really uh, it's really a hardship to continue working uh, in ill health. And that's a better outcome, obviously. So it's not always more employment uh, is better. In terms of what ADB is doing to support the conclusions of the report, you know, we stand ready to really support all of the member country governments of ADB to uh, think both strategically and also think about specific project and interventions that can uh, support healthy aging. We've been active in this area. So our human and social development uh, sector group has uh, been supporting some kind of uh, general projects in the area of healthcare and social protection that really have particular benefits for older workers. So one example is Bangladesh, where we support a uh, primary care program for urban poor, which include many older people. And we're also supporting efforts to improve the performance of Bangladesh's old age subsidy program. A second area in terms of supporting reforms at a more a broad level is through our uh, policy-based loans where we try to link budgetary support to reaching certain reform targets. And sometimes those can include targets related to pension system reform. And finally, uh, we have been engaging in efforts to support improvements in the community care for the elderly uh, in a number of countries. So in China, um, you know, supporting healthy aging has been an important part of the partnership strategy between ADB and the Chinese government. And we have a current uh, technical assistance project where we're working with Indonesia, Mongolia, and Sri Lanka on innovative community-based long-term care systems and services. Uh, so those are some examples of uh, the things that ADB can do to support uh, the recommendations of the report. Thank you, Albert. Uh, now, let me uh, just uh, uh, give some questions that were asked by the audience. I think uh, perhaps Aiko can take a first crack and maybe other um, the panelists can also chime in. So 
This question was in the Q&A. I don't see it anymore, but I think it's an important question, so I'll ask it anyway. Um, of the four dimensions of old age well-being you mentioned, are they all equally important or are some more important than others? And what is the relationship between the four dimensions of old age well-being? Aiko? Thanks, Tom, and thanks for the question. Yeah, so we we have looked at then how different determinants affect well-being measured in the life satisfactions or being in a good mental health state. And health is the key element, but we just say health. So what are they? Not having uh, you know, a more diagnosed disease, having a good mobility in terms of the physical functioning, also mental health, and cognitive health. So there are different elements to it. And it seems like uh, having uh, less illness and having a good physical mobility explain quite an element of being feeling well. So that is very important. And um, there will be a large interlink between uh, four elements of uh, well-being. For example, being health will be able to allow you to work, allow you to uh, do different things. Um, being economically secured would, for example, evidence would show that you will be less likely to be depressed. So it's all very integrated system of well-being. By its section, by report, we deal with it independently, but we feel that those are highly interconnected. If country fails to achieve one element, it's going to drag the others. If country is going to do well in one, it's going to have much more positive effects throughout. That's how we see it. Thank you. Thank you, Aiko. So another question is uh, the indicators that you showed, Aiko, indicated only 40% of uh, eight. 40% of older people have a pension, right? The pension coverage rate is very low. So what is the main reason for the low pension coverage across the region? I think, again, maybe I go, you answer first, and the uh, panelists can hopefully chime in. I go. Sure. The report points to several uh, reasons. First, most fundamental is the informality of work. So most of these pensions are linked to employment. And if your work does not give you access to contributing membership to these pensions, you do not have it. Um, second, uh, it's, it's uh, gender. We, we also we put in the gender issues. You saw that women have much less access, to, particularly to the contributory pensions. It's because their work years are less or that they'll be working less hours, which would then limit their ability to make the full payment that would give them the access to the contributed pension. So those are some of the key factors. The report also look at the social pension, which is non-contributory uh, cash assistance type to older workers. Here we see that the, such allowance are reaching poor people. So it has more of a redistributive effect. But still, there's a administrative capacity issues, which then are not meeting even half of the poorest uh, one fourth, one fifth of the groups. So th there is definitely the administrative capacity and lack of the full fund to really reach the people that needs to receive these services. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Aiko. Now let me direct can, this question. Can I jump in, Tom? No, I'd like yeah, to please, go, that. please go ahead, sir. I mean. Uh, the, the big issue for expanding social pension coverage to the informal sector is that it costs money, and a lot of governments feel they don't have enough money <laughs> to do that and all the other things they're trying to accomplish. So, you know, one thing we also support at ADB is trying to support governments to try to increase the domestic resource mobilization, raise more tax revenue, because this is key, I think, to being able to do more things, including social pension uh um, provision. You know, I was living in Hong Kong, and there was a huge review of the um, the Provident Fund system, and there was a recognition that it wasn't providing enough finance for older people when they retired. And there was a proposal by a blue panel commission to have a universal pension for all uh, older people in Hong Kong, uh, but it didn't make it through because the government felt that um, to 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 finance that they would need to raise taxes. And they were in Hong Kong, especially, they have a huge revulsion to raising taxes. And so 
they ended up settling for a more targeted social pension program, just providing social pension to poor poor people. I think that's fine. But I think even modest amounts of support, if you look at the experience of China and other places, can really make a difference um, in in the lives of older people by putting a little bit mon of money in their, in their pockets. So I still think it's something that governments need to just prioritize in terms of thinking about the benefits and also thinking about how to raise uh, revenues. Thank you, Albert. Now, this uh, final question, Keep your answer to one minute each is for the three panelists. Let's go the order of Albert, Dr. Laowong, and Professor Ostrowan. So, of course, you talk a lot about the government policy recommendations in this report, and rightfully so. But what can the private sector or civil society do to promote, uh, to help Asia age well? Starting with you, Albert. Right, that's a very good question. I think, um, and, and it's appropriate since uh, Asian Development Bank is now really thinking about supporting a private sector shift, shift where we try to bring the private sector into solutions more and more. Uh, I think NGO, the civil uh, society community, I mean, civil civil uh, society organizations can really help just by as advocates for the well-being of uh, older people to bring more attention and pressure onto governments to affect change, and of course. Um, to the extent that they have better knowledge of uh, the needs of uh, specific groups of vulnerable elderly, they can also help in uh, delivering solutions. Uh, businesses, I think, uh, need to be a bit more active in imagining a world where older workers can be productive for longer. Uh, that can mean uh, making sensible investments in um, ergonomic environments in the workplace, uh, maybe a physical um, uh, uh, health support um, in in provided by employers that can actually yield very high returns in terms of maintaining and increasing the productivity of older workers, and to recognize you know the ways in which older workers can continue contribute continue to contribute to productivity even after they pass retirement age and be flexible in thinking about uh, possible work arrangements, et cetera. And then communi communicating all of these possibilities to uh, to the government to think about what are the supportive uh, policy or institutional reforms that need to be made to support that type of effort. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. We are all running out of time. So one minute each, Dr. Laowong and Professor uh, Strohan. Okay, Dr. Sure. Laowong. Okay, yeah. sure. I mean, for the private sector, because, you know, they kind of hide nearly half of the workforce, you know, in, in Thailand. And I think what they have to do and what we as a private sector and also the whole society is to normalize, you know, um, the elderly employment. Let it be like the normal you know, circumstance that, okay, people can hide like the elderly. Normalize it. I think that's, that's the first way that we can do and we need a big support you know from the private sector okay, and of thank course you. more than but but more than half more than half of the workforce you know are in the okay. informal sector so i think the community-led approach or maybe the okay. you know, participation of the cso would be the key yeah. area to you know supplement okay. the action in okay. the level okay thank you one minute professor okay so my last my parting words would be empower the community, empower each of us to be active agency for what we need, right? So that's how we can unlock community assets which have not been realized yet. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Aiko, Albert, Professor Strohan, and uh, Dr. Laowong. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for supporting the Asian Impact Webinar Series since 2020. For updates on upcoming web webinars, please check the webpage in ADB Org, and you can also view past webinars from ADB's official YouTube channel. Please also follow uh, ADB's chief economist, Albert Park, who was a panelist today on Twitter or X, to gain insights into development challenges facing Asia and the Pacific. And last but not least, we're also planning some additional seminars that will uh, look at other dimensions of uh, old age well-being. Today, we look primarily at work, but we will also look at health, old age, economic security, and other dimensions. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>